Lads, lasses, and all of God's masses, welcome back. My legal name is C28. And I'm on fire, but not literally. Um, my, if my skin seems redder than usual, that's not the editor doing a terrible job at color correction. Um, rather, it's me having my skin, avoiding myself getting cancer um, of the skin variety. Because, uh, well, the sun is a deadly laser. Anyway, I, um, I didn't shoot any video logs pretty much uh, after that second one, the hundredth video log. Yay, special. Um, not really a special, just a average video log. Uh, so here's what's going to happen. I am going to, as succinctly as possible, try to sum up the entire class of fundamentals of music business. That, uh, that may prove to be difficult. You may also notice I seem extraordinarily grounded in this scenery. That's because I'm not using the green screen today. I found that that's actually not a very um, exceptional visual. <laughs> it just got progressively worse and worse the more I tried adding stuff to it. So I'm going to let the content evolve naturally. We're just going to see how things go. We're not going to try to push things. We're not going to say, okay, we got to upgrade. Let's do this now. No, we're, we're just going to see how things evolve naturally. So let's um, get into it. So I believe we would be leaving off then at week two. So let's pick up on week two of fundamentals of music business. So week two goes into branding. How do you make your identity? What even is a brand? Well, the brand isn't necessarily the things you have trademarked. It's not even your company name. It's not even the ways in which you use fonts or your logo. Your brand is how people perceive you. So there are three C's of branding that are important to keep in mind. The first one is communication. It is just getting it across of, hey, who are you? Now, on top of that, it's also like, what are you doing? Who's your audience? Why would your audience want you? It's all the, the whys and the how. Think of it as your bio. Uh, very important things to have. The second C is community, is building that sense of loyalty with your brand. People buy, say, Samsung Galaxy phones, probably because they're really cool tech that they like putting in it and trying new stuff, but brand loyalty. They've trusted this thing. The phone's been reliable for them. They have been given software support for however many years. They like the brand. That's what people go for it. I think as well, I would say like a car manufacturer, someone likes um, Honda. I, I was thinking whether I want to say Hyundai or Honda, but I think Honda has a, a little bit stronger of a, um, a community sense with their brand. Uh, I may be dead wrong, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Blast me in the comments below and tell me, C28, you're absolutely wrong. No. If, if I am absolutely wrong. No. Now, community is not just building a sense of community with yourself and your consumers, but also the other people around you. Is how do you fit in with the wider industry? So think of yourself as, say, an audio engineer. Very simple. If you're an... <laughs> that was not a correct statement. Very simple. But... For full sale, a simple example, maybe. But if you're an audio engineer, you may become a member of, say, IATSE. If you're doing some sort of show pro type stuff, you may become a member of um, the RIA at some point. Uh, you might become a member of, say, the Audio Engineering Society or ASCAP or something along those lines. Um, now, I imagine ASCAP is probably just like US. On this. You're absolutely insane. You live in the UK and you're like, you know what? I want to join ASCAP anyway. It's, it's an American organization for like composers, musicians, and whatnot. Yeah. Now, very huge. And this is kind of going against what we were taught in pop culture and media, but they kind of go hand in hand. If you, if you get the extreme of one end, you get the extreme of the other end, you find the truth is somewhere in the middle. Um, don't buy fans. So in pop culture media, there was a lot talked about. You could just, you know, fake your fan base to grow and it does a pretty good job. And a lot of people end up doing this. 
and they end up very successful. So ends up, you know, buying fans can be really good for you. However, comma, make sure that you end up growing more real fans than fake fans. And the best way to do that is to only make real fans. I have not bought any fans on YouTube. Now, I did post a really stupid edit to um, the... The meme was called Computer Chip Walking to Staying Alive. Yes, it's an any 555 timer integrated circuit thing. I, I know. But the meme was Computer Chip. In fact, I got bullied into uh, making it any 555, but whatever. But that, that blew up. And then eventually uh, I got a lot of um, subscribers from that video. Not fake, but definitely outside the normal um, content for my channel. Maybe I'll post more dumb meme edits. I was literally just upset that no one actually had the steps in sync. So I was like, you know what? Let's put them in sync. And now it has like however many million views. And I think it's the, the top search result right now. If you search any 555 walking to staying alive. I don't quite remember what I was going for with this. Hmm. I mean, bottom line is just don't have purchased fake fans as your primary collection of fans buy other <laughs> buy ah <laughs> acquire other fans yes and the last c in these three c's of business is consistency not just consistency in like who you are as an individual like say myself doing these video logs to stay hey look it's me i'm a real person and my different series that i've, I've not been doing for months but Consistency in your work, like what I've not been doing for months. And, uh, you know, me dropping off the face of the earth for the entire month of August. Um, <laughs> yeah. So consistency is, is very important. And I knew that I was going to feel very hypocritical for bringing this up once I did bring it up because of how I haven't shot any video logs past week one. Yeah. Um, I'm going to see if I can improve on that. But that's that's. Good summary. I'm going to try to um, condense the rest of the information because a lot of this I don't think you really need. There are some real nitty gritty great details that I could give you, but in the interest of time, I'm going to say this. If you're curious about any of the information that I got from Full Sail, I'm not going to give you the bloody lecture. That's not happening, mate. I'm sorry. But what I can give you is what I know. Seriously. Reach out in the comments. If you've got a question, I'll answer it the best I can. Maybe I'll have a little disclaimer of I'm not a lawyer, but like, this is probably what you should do. Most of the stuff in lecture, though, um, is ended with, but seek legal advice on this. <laughs> Let's go to lecture four. So lecture four touches on trademarks. Technically, it's still within the branding discussion of stuff. Week two is branding. But what are trademarks? Well, let's touch on this. We probably know copyright and trademark are, are kings. These different things you can do to your work, you can copyright your work, you can trademark your work. But what is the difference? Difference is simple. Copyright is when you have an original creative idea. Creative. That you have made tangible. That you can copyright. Say if you made a song. Boom, copyright it. Say if you made a book. Boom, copyright it. But what you can't necessarily copyright is a way of doing things. Or a name or a slogan because you didn't really make those words unless you made the word up but still for stuff like that it's best to trademark it logos especially you could copyright your logo it's way more advisable to trademark your logo trademarks are this it's simply a source identifier it's a way of identifying who has made the product or service Say, I, I say, uh, just do it, you know, Nike. Uh, if I say something like, uh, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, even though it's way out of tune and rhythm, despite the fact of me just saying, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, you know, I'm talking about McDonald's, of course. And that might scare you how deeply ingrained ba -da -ba 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 is in your head that ba -da -ba 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 still works. That's mad. Now, for the purpose of this lecture, we're really focusing on US law. When you trademark something, when you copyright something, you're typically just doing it within one nation. Now, the EU does have a fancy little thing where you can get your stuff copyrighted, trademarked within 
all the EU countries, which is nice. But realistically, if you want things to be worldwide protected, just check country per country, everywhere that you're curious about that respects ownership and register it with them, which is going to get pricey indeed. That means like if I register a trademark for um, C28 wires, like, like say I start manufacturing wires, like aux cables or something, then I could have that trademark for C28 cables in the States, but then someone else in Canada could just make C28 cables in Canada. And that's totally fine because they don't abide by US law. Same with like Ireland or Germany or China. I mean, China probably doesn't care about even Europe, but still you get the point. Actually, I don't even know if China, does China have copyright? Answer is here. I wish I could see that. I wish so deeply I could see that. Oh, well. So next question I have for you is what are those little uh, circle bios with the, the letters in them? We've seen like a C with the circle. We're like, oh, okay, cool. That's copyright. We've seen a TM with the circle. Okay, that's trademark. What about the R thing? What about the SM thing? What are those? So here's what those are. Those are this. First up, if you just have TM trademark on your logo, while technically it could be registered, it doesn't explicitly state that. R is a registered trademark. So when you see a little R, that means seriously do not use this thing for your own personal work or you'll probably definitely lose a lawsuit against this company. TM, however, tread lightly. They have established their own brand identity. They could definitely still sue you for using their stuff, but they haven't registered their work necessarily with the US Patent and Trademark Office, USPTO. So they could just use a TM. Like say, for instance, if, um, I don't know, if I were to mass produce these flags, I probably would not spend the effort trademarking it. I've already got C28 um, all good and whatnot legally. So I'm not going to bother about trademarking flags. So if I start selling flags of C28 flags, I'm probably not going to register that. I'm just going to be like, okay, cool, whatever. And put a little TM on it. That means you could most certainly make your own C28 flags and start selling them. And then I could do something about it. But I, I really, but you're just giving me free advertising, mate. I, I don't mind. <laughs> I dare you, do it. You won't. You won't mass produce C28 flags for people to put on their thing. Ha. Huh. <laughs> now I did mention one other thing. The other thing is SM for a service mark. And that's not really for a product. It's more so for a service. So what are examples of that? Think of say FedEx. FedEx is providing a service. Think of, say, Amazon Web Services. They provide service. Um, some moving company, they provide a service. So they, they might service mark things as opposed to trademarking them or registering that trademark. It's still, of course, registered. So service marks are definitely still registered trademarks. Um, but there is that distinction between having a registered trademark and a non-registered trademark where you just have TM versus R. Um, though... I think just for the nature of people knowing what TM means, I feel like some people might want to use TM anyway, even if they did register their trademark. There are, of course, legal, easy legal protections. If you register your trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office, which I think is really cheap too, it's like 30 quid, something like that, something around that range, similar to like what you do for copyright. I think copyright can range from between like 32 to 40 something, 60 if you, just depends on the different packages you got, uh, what you're doing. Yeah, trademark's cheap, but only really do it if you need it. I mean, you still own what you've made. You still have a right to be like, hey, you're kind of messing with my brand image, uh, stop. And if they don't, then pursue legal action. But it certainly helps when you have stuff trademarked. So what can you trademark? Well, here's what you can do. You can trademark the following. I'm just going to read off the list. I'm not even going to hide the fact that I'm reading it. You can trademark names. That means like domain names. And that means the name of your company. Notice how I made that distinction. You may not want to copyright it, but instead trademark, because you can trademark Amazon. You can trademark Google. You can trademark C28. But you probably wouldn't 
copyright it. By the way, you can't uh, trademark C2A. It's uh, spoken for. Or Google or Amazon or Bing. And they're, they're spoken for. Yeah. Also, sounds. Think of the MGM lion roar. Think of Netflix. Ba-dum, whatever that, that. Why is it rocket sound? It's not rocket sound. But, um. Uh, you could trademark, say, the C2A intro that I might change. The one that goes... Lands like... No, okay. So, you, you get the idea. Um, sounds can be trademarked. Or copyrighted. But, depending on how you're using them, you probably want to trademark them. Smells can even be trademarked. That's bizarre. Why smells? And our instructor gave us a, a really good um, example of that. He asked for a volunteer. I, I volunteer tiered and he said close your eyes you know that usually doesn't go anywhere good uh, so anyway um eyes closed places an object in front of me and says what is this i see an expo marker and i was wrong yeah it was played out but that was my second guess and i was, I was right <laughs> so ex expo and played out maybe uh get in cahoots with each other and be like hey why is uh, or maybe just my nose socks but i never had covid so i don't know why um hmm the point is you can trademark the smell of your product but think of candle companies air fresheners oh do they trademark scents yes they do yes yes, yes, yes they do colognes perfumes oh yeah they're trademarking that stuff even colors can be trademarked which is strange think of the t-mobile pink tiffany blue um think of before it became x uh the twitter blue all these things. Well, I wish I had another example uh, that was not blue, but other companies have trademark colors. And really what they're trademarking is the hexadecimal color. So but there are some weird, freaky things when it comes to how close can it be? Because when you print off that color, it's going to differ from the hexadecimal. If you shine different light on it, it's going to differ from the hexadecimal. But you own the hexadecimal number. So really, it's like, will someone confuse this color for this company's color? There's a lot of that. If confusion is the main marker of, are you allowed to do this? Will there be confusion among customers? That's really what it boils down to. Now, what can you not trademark? Well, that's probably good to get into as well. You cannot trademark anything that is scandalous, immoral, deceptive, personal names, or geographical names or places. Though Those cannot be trademarked unfortunately. And by geographical names or places, that, that's real geographical names or places. So like, I couldn't trademark the United States of America. That, that, no. <laughs> There's no trademark for that. So yeah, go ahead and post memes online about, hey, did you know that the US doesn't hold a copyright or trademark to their name? <laughs> so good luck trying to get yours. <laughs> so next week, we dove into copyright. If you remember from the class Audio Arts and the Entertainment and Media Industries before they axed it for some TikTok editing class, I don't know what it's called, but some sort of video production thing that teaches about personal marketing, I forget exactly what it is, because I won't ever take it, um, unless I audit it. I might, I might audit it, to be honest. But AEM was a pretty great class, taught you um, the jobs that are in the industry, so why did they get rid of that? It's so weird. But one of the first classes you take, the first class in your actual degree program that you take. and Mm. I'm still spiteful that they got rid of the class because that is so good for students to have. But whatever. If you're starting full sale, just let me tell you. Just research what jobs are there. I, I will just ask about it in the comments if you're actually curious and I will post like the links and stuff from the class to the US government websites where you can do all the research yourself. Oh my goodness, it's so good to do. I came into full sale being like, I'm going to be a music artist like everyone else. Like, until you realize how stupid that plan is. And now I'm a general audio engineer, which way more profitable, honestly way more exciting and fun, and way better connections doing that. Um, an artist is a tool in my domain of work. I probably just lost so many clients. So we talked about what a trademark is, what it represents, the sort of the company, like the identifier of the source. But what is a copyright? A copyright differs from a trademark because the copyright is 
on a thing, a tangible thing. So when you create a piece of art, whether that is a book, whether that is audio, whether that is an image, and you can point to this thing here, once you got that, you actually already have copyright on that. But registering it helps you a whole lot in the legal domain of things. So if you're just a, a person doing things for fun, unless you just want it for like funsies, you really, really don't need to copyright your work unless it's starting to go out into the industry. Then at that point, yeah, you probably want to consider trademarking it because it makes it a whole lot easier to prove that you own the stuff. So the claimant, the person who is saying, hey, I own this copyright, gets that copyright for their entire life plus 70 years. Thanks, Disney. Uh, if you're not familiar, Disney fought for ages to keep the copyright on Steamboat Willie, our Mickey Mouse. And so every time it was about to expire, the copyright, because Disney has not lived um, up to today. They're like, what if we extended it to a few years after? And then they hit that time again. But what if we extended it to a few years after? And then they hit that time again. And But what if we extended it to a few years after? And then they hit, yeah, it kept going until it became 70 years after the passing of the person. Some people don't even live that long, but okay. Uh, but now you get that. So the lifetime of the person plus 70 years after they're dead, the dead person gets to keep that copyright or whoever it passes on to. After that point, it enters the public domain. So I can have this boyo here. Hi, hi, friendo. And we can vibe together on this video and I can make money on this video because that friendo's copyright expired. Bye. So that's, that's very fun. So what can you copyright? We got into trademark, same sort of deal. What can you trademark? But what can you copyright? Well, you can copyright the following. You can copyright any sort of literary work. That means books. That means texts of any sort. Those can be copyrighted. You can copyright the performing arts of stuff. Any plays, films, whatnot you got. If you made a fun little um, student film, but it's like really doing well on YouTube, go ahead and copyright that friendo. Uh, but YouTube's got you covered on that. And not with an official copyright, but like they'll protect you. Visual arts, meaning any sculptures, any artwork you make. And sound recordings, music, sound effects. My voice, I, I think, maybe? Yeah, yeah, my voice. You could definitely copyright your voice, I think. Maybe. Can you? I'm not going to look it up, but you could look it up for me and be like in the comments, hey, see to it, you're way wrong. But uh, I'm pretty sure because you could technically fake your voice. Um, well, I could say, all right, from this point in time, I'm now going to sound like an American. And this fabricated voice that I'm going to speak in, that is something of my creation. That is a complete fabricated product that I'm going to use for the duration of this video. No, I'm not. I, I promise you, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do that actually. But, uh, that voice is a creative work. And I was able to point to that thing being the audio of that voice and be like, Hey, I own that. You know what? No, I fell into a trap. It's not copyright. It's trademark because it's the thing. It's the idea. You trademark the idea of the sound, but not the sound itself. I could trademark the voice, but I'd have to copyright each individual clip. So when you import to that thing, that's when you can copyright it. So I made a mistake, but at least I rectified it. Yeah. The next lecture in week three was about distribution. And I'm actually going to skip over this entire lecture. Week four was this. Week four was contracts. Ooh. Scary. But really not. There's a lot I could place here. But the runtime of this video is around 30 minutes or so already. So I'm going to condense it for, well, really myself who's editing this later. <laughs> so what is a contract? A contract is a agreement made between two people. Important. It has to be documented. Have to document. If you can't document it, you can't do much with that contract, can you? So like, say if I did this, if I said between you and myself, now I don't know you, so like this would fail in the eyes of actual law, but say you and I, you the audience, me the me, 
were at some sort of big convention. And I said to you, I will post a video on Friday. And you can quote me on that. And then I don't post a video on Friday. I've broken a contract with you. And you could sue me for that. <laughs> now, because the audience here is ambiguous and there's not actually a parody we can point to, you, not really. So, but think of it this way. If you and your mate are in the kitchen vibing and your mate says, hey, um, could you get me a lift to the airport on Monday? And you say, yeah, yeah I gotcha. And your mate was being sneaky and recorded that. And you don't pick him up on Monday. That's a breach of contract. Because you made an agreement. That's recorded. Documented. Now it's a lot nicer when this isn't done secretly and of course on paper or digital form. When between yourself and your client you write down, okay, here's what I need from you. Here's what you need from me. These things will be done. If they're not this, 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 this and so many clauses about things that happen. Please, if you're going to be doing work, Especially if you are a sole proprietor, do contracts. Sole proprietor, by the way, meaning person who's just doing work freelancing by themselves solo, they don't got a company or anything. Me, C28, I got my business, I'm vibing. But you, random person who I'm speaking to, Sarah, again, Sarah's just gonna be the, the placeholder name for some random person I'm speaking about. Um, you, Sarah, uh, if you don't have your business, then you're just working by yourself and that's dangerous because then they can sue you the person uh, unless you get a contract saying otherwise that oh actually no uh i'm fully within the contract i didn't break anything but of course if you didn't break the contract it does actually help your clients whole bunch of stuff let me start reading stuff so i can give you more useful content than me blabbering about nonsense in the realm of music what needs to be in your contract and this kind of applies to every contract but some things are very specific. Like the first thing, the RP3D, which I didn't mention at all until now. So let me explain the RP3D. Let's go back a few lectures. So going back to lecture five real quick on copyrights, we did touch on the RP3D, which are the rights of the claimant, the person who owns the copyright. Or you can also apply these to contracts because you're making a product for someone or doing a service for the someone. Anyway, here's the RP3D. Starts with this. R. You have the right to reproduce the work. P. You have the right to perform the work. Do it live. You have the right to distribute the work. Put it on sites like SoundCloud. Or Apple Music. Or Spotify. Or Pandora. Or Tidal. You have the right to display images, things referencing this product. You can advertise this product. And the right to derive, be derivative, make a sequel, a, a prequel, just things based off that product. Contracts should talk about these rights. Next up, it should talk about the duration. Oh my goodness, should it talk about a duration. If your contract is indefinite, that's really bad for one individual. Um, yeah. Don't. Just don't. Don't sign a contract that has no expiration. Have a time limit. Even if you know you're going to be working with this person for the rest of your life. Like, I trust them. They're so great. Cool. Refresh the contract again. Sign the same contract for another term. Just do that. Please do that. Next up is money stuffs. What currency are you going to get paid in? How much will you get paid? When will you get paid? Are they going to pay you with, like, a car? They say, well, yeah, we're going to give you uh, $30,000 for working on this project. Or are they going to say, yeah, we're going to um, give you a higher net worth of, like, $30,000. And they don't tell you, oh, yeah, we got someone who sells used cars. And, um, you know, we got this. 2006 Honda Civic. Don't know if they were out at 2006, but maybe they were. And we've given it an appraisal of about $30,000, which it's definitely not worth. So this is yours now for working on the project. Thank you. That would suck. So make sure it's very clear how you'll get paid, what you'll get paid in, how frequently you'll get paid. 
Very, very important. Should also mention the country that this is in. Seems strange, but like, well, it's between myself and my mate or my company or whatever. Why does that matter? To know the regulations that are going to apply to this person within whose laws? The laws of Germany? Is it going to be, um, say, Romania? Is it going to be, say, Spain? Where is it at? So know the, the country that uh, is represented within this contract. Whose laws do each party need to abide by? Competition is the next thing, which maybe you don't need this in every contract, but it's important to understand the domain of work you're within. So for them to state, hey, here are some of the other people that we work with, or these are the people that we are working against. You don't really need to have that in the contract per se, but important stuff to note. Say you're working for the Coca-Cola company and you don't know about the rivalry between them and PepsiCo. And suddenly you go into work wearing a PepsiCo shirt and they're like, ha ha, very funny. And they don't give you that promotion you were looking for. Something like that. It could get more intense, less intense. And think of other companies too and other relationships, dynamics before signing a contract with some rando. Definitely know within their industry, who are their competitors? It may not need to be clearly listed on the contract. Maybe it's nice if it is, but really I think it, it's often not, but it's an important thing to think about when signing a contract. Next up, we got future work, which honestly, I probably should have written this first note within the competition, so that way I wouldn't have blabbered on for so long, but a non-compete agreement is something that's often within contracts, especially during the term of when you're working. And often after as well, for maybe a few months, maybe a few years, maybe a decade, that would suck. But a non-compete agreement essentially states, while you're working with us, you're not allowed to work for anyone else. Maybe at all, you're not even allowed to work at McDonald's, or maybe you're not allowed to work with any one of these people, or maybe you're not allowed to work within the industry uh, outside of us. And this could be set for the duration of the contract, or it could be set for the duration of the contract plus a year or so. Like I said, it could go on for a bit longer. But analyze that. See what that is, if it exists within the contract. And then lastly, just what do you want that wasn't covered? Check the clauses. See, is there something you want that's not in there? Maybe you want studio time. Maybe you want them to pay your lawyer's fees should you get in a disagreement. Maybe you want to make sure that um, there's no arbitration taking place. Disney. Um, Maybe some sort of agreement that like, if I happen to use one of these other products, arbitration can't take place because I'm using this other completely separate product. Disney, um, stuff like that. And then final, just good practices things that I wrote down. Know what you want. Do your research. Ask questions, of course. Look for the win-win situation. Take notes and follow up with them. Don't sign the first contract. Do not. Unless it's like, an apartment, in which case they don't care about you at all, usually. My apartment complex is actually really nice and awesome and I really love the staff that we have, but typically that's solidified and they're like, cool, we'll get someone else, bye. But a contract agreement between yourself and say a record label, that's pretty flexible. So don't sign the first thing. In fact, a big red flag is if they want you to sign immediately. They're like, oh, congratulations, we've actually accepted you into the label. Can you come into the office today and sign the contract? Absolutely not. In fact, they shouldn't even be sending you the contract. They should be sending your lawyer the contract and the two lawyers should converse, talk about what's best and then reconvene with their clients. And then you with your lawyer talk about what was talked about. And if you like it, the lawyer will say, yeah, I think it's good for you. We should do this. Okay, cool. Maybe we could have done this a little bit better. What's your call? What do you want to do? And then their lawyers will be like, yeah, same thing. And then you're both happy and that way you don't have to get angry with the label. They don't have to get angry with you. Um, the lawyers can work it out. And they might even be buddies. Probably not. So funny enough, I actually have a continuation of this list that I, I forgot about. Pretty much saying, be so very specific in your contracts. Just that you may have seen some funny YouTube videos where like uh, parents will have their children write instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then they follow it to a T. And it's like, stick the knife inside the peanut butter and they stick it the wrong way in, spread the peanut butter on the bread, and they take the jar and they go, you know, be very specific in your contracts. Have a lawyer help you out if you wish to. But again, if you're working with people you know, 
as long as the language is not ambiguous, you're probably going to be good. But you maybe don't want probably. <laughs> what a phrase. You maybe don't want probably. C28, 2024. And the last little thing here, consider looking at getting a lawyer on a retainer basis. So you pay month by month to have access to this lawyer for however many minutes. Maybe it's only like six minutes. Maybe it's 20 minutes. Maybe it's an hour per month, per week, whatever. But look for a lawyer on a, a retainer basis where that way, whenever you have questions, you don't have to pay $60 an hour. You've already paid, say, 30 quid for the month. And you can go back and back and back and back and back to the lawyer. Good. That's pretty nice. Or if you feel that it would be necessary to get a lawyer with you for like hours at a time, maybe pay the lawyer fee. So that leaves us to the conclusion of this class. So I did leave out a lot of information, like a lot, a lot of information uh, when it comes to more stuff on trademarks and copyrights, um, setting up your business uh, and contracts. There, there's so much different clauses, different types of registration things you need. Uh, we had a assignment where we had to register a song, uh, not actually register it, but get the process almost completely ready, with the exception of submit to register copyright on a song of ours. So really going in depth with the process, understanding the different types of things you could choose, different things you could select. And I'll be honest with you, had I not procrastinated this video log, which should have been four video logs or more, I probably would have gone into detail with that. So I'm sorry. But again, if you're curious about any of these things, seriously, you can just ask a question in the comment section. I will answer you. If I need to add a disclaimer of, but seek legal advice, I will do that. And then you should probably heed that. Um, and I'm telling you now, so that way you don't come whining, C28 told me this, but I went bankrupt and try suing me. No. I told you to get legal advice and I'm not a lawyer. I'm an audio engineer. So overall, the class is outstanding. Uh, I say that with pretty much every class, but this is, let's, let's give it a better descriptor. This is an essential cornerstone class of recording arts, despite not necessarily being, how do you engineer? How do you do this? How do you exist as a business entity and stay good standing with the IRS, with the US Patent and Trademark Office, with copyright.org, with the federal government, with other federal governments. Very good stuff to know, have good practice with. We got practice with these things. We didn't just talk about them, we did them. So that's awesome. That's very important stuff. And this class is actually getting broken into another one of entrepreneurship, which will, you'll have some of this information in that class, which will expand further on it. And in future, if you're joining Full Sail now, you'll actually have this class in your lineup. Entrepreneurship, I think, is the name of the course. I'm not fully certain on that. But anyway, the class actually has you register your LLC or business type of any, whatever it is. You actually have to register your business to legally be an entity. That is awesome. Yeah, it costs money. It's like a hundred something. So it might be tricky. Maybe they'll put something in the launch box where it's like, we have a retainer fund of like 125. I think that's the fee to file in Florida. Um, so you'll get that. So that way you can use those funds to pay for your LLC. Or maybe they'll just like say, hey, keep 150 because you're going to need it for this class. I'm not sure what they'll do, but you'll need to register your company. What if I don't want to? Um... I don't have any answer for you other than it's a really bloody good idea to be at least an LLC because like you don't want to get sued personally. The corporate veil can of course be pierced, but have the corporate veil, <laughs> have a veil there. If you make a mistake and someone comes after you like, hey, you told me you'd be mixing five tracks, but I only see four here in the submission and you close out the contract. I'm suing you. No, 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 my friend, you are suing C28 music, which doesn't look great, of course, um, but that keeps you out of crazy legal trouble. And your business is now in that crazy legal trouble. You still have to deal with it. But of course, it's not tied directly to your name. So if you want to work for someone else, you're not a, say, person who's been charged with fraud. Your business has. 
and you can dissociate from that business. Especially if you've got an EIN. Very good. It's just name, EIN, register the company under the EIN. EIN doesn't know who you are. And now, boom, safety. If you do something crazy legal, though, the peoples will go after you and you will definitely not have a corporate bail. But um, yeah, this class is like safety. Industry business safety. That's what this class is. That's why it's so very important and why I went ranting about all these different things. It's a stupidly important class for your own safety legally. It's not legal advice per Full Sail University. It's not legal advice. But it's, it's advice on legal things. If you get what I'm saying, if you catch my drift, it's like, yeah, good things to know. So if you're watching this one, thank you so much for all the guidance you've given me and everyone else in the class. It's been a fantastic month. And I've definitely been impacted the most from this class of any other class. Honestly, I, I put this class's impact on me above mixing techniques, which crazy revamp on my production process. Because now I'm seeing the business world from a completely different perspective. And it's not scary. It's really not scary anymore, which is huge. So thank you, seriously. So now we go on to the next part of this video, which is the next class, which happened today. Because of Labor Day, we actually didn't have lecture for this class yet. We went straight to lab. For what class? Well, it is in the title, of course. But uh, class is session recording. A very, very scary class, I hear. Just out of fear, I'm just going to check the camera to make sure it's still rolling. That'd be terrifying if it wasn't. <sighs> okay, I don't know. Just something came over me. I was like, what if it wasn't recording? That, that would suck so much, but uh, it, it is recording indeed. So we can continue. So let's get into it. Session recording. I know very little about this class because we literally have not had lecture yet. It was a wild day. I came into the class not knowing a whole lot. I know the tools we needed to have. I brought them all with me. Didn't use any of them. We had a session. We had an artist and an engineer. And we just watched a session play out. So we're using, um, in lecture today, we use the API Vision Console. I use the API Vision Channel Strip plugin by Universal Audio for mastering. And so I'm, I'm quite familiar with some of the little pieces in there. But then seeing the whole thing, I'm like, whoa, I don't know what most of this does. And we're going to have to learn that. This course is a language course. It's teaching you how to understand the language of consoles. So there's a lot of reading. And reading the manuals is going to be important. So what I plan to do, actually, is I'm going to create an LLM, a large language model, an AI. I hate that term. Um, creating a large language model for this class, where I upload all the information, train it on that, and I'm good to go. Because information is going to be stupid important to hold on to and have organized. So I'm going to make sure, contract with you. I think it'd be really important if I made a video log after every lecture and lab. So that's the contract is that I think that. If I suddenly think I don't think that, then I've broken the contract with you. Um, but I want to, of course. But last month I didn't do any because I was so busy. And I'm going to be way busier this month. So odds are I won't make any other videos other than this one. But I really should. So not a whole lot really for this class. Because again, like I said, we didn't have lecture yet. I don't really know what the class fully entails. Uh, I was looking at the different assignments we have. And most of them, almost all of them, seem to be evaluations of our progress of how fluently do you understand these consoles. So we're going to be working with the API Vision. That was the one we had today. We're also going to be working with the Rupert Neve 5088. And as well as the SSL Duality. So those are the three consoles we're going to be working with throughout the month. And I have to be fluent in them, which is the downfall of this class for many people. Um, you've got to read the manuals and know them intimately. Hence the large language model to assist me with that. So I'll have it just give me random quizzes on random things, put me in a scenario and I have to walk it through it. Uh, just give me an exam like every five hours on the way. I haven't actually fully created that model yet i just have like the data set so i got most of the model when it comes to its information just not the 
actual speaking to the documents part. I don't think I got anything else. So, C two H segment. I don't know what to say. There's not much to say, is there? Erg. I wish I had things to say, but I don't. So, if you enjoyed today's content, you can subscribe, and YouTube will happily give you more content like this from myself and other creators, which is quite fun indeed. If you super enjoyed the content, you can join. Become a Control Voltage by hitting that little blue button that pops up after you subscribe, and you will get early access to videos, behind the scenes content, and access to the Discord server, which is very cool. We got lots of uh, Control Voltages, hopefully in the future, that'll be going there, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. If you have any questions or comments, you can, of course, leave those questions or comments in the comment section below, and I'll get back to them. Post them in this space if they're really cool or interesting comments that I think everyone else should see. I hope you all take care of yourselves. May the grace and blessings of the Most High God be with you. And goodbye, YouTube.